introduction and thanks for having me. Can you hear me in the back? It seems like because it's all pretty good if my voice gives out, I've got more, so we're good. But if anyone wants to move up, that's also good. Be friendly, don't bite, etc. So um, the topic today is vegetarianism. And I'm not here to ask how many people are vegetarian, but I thought it would be really good if we went around just for a moment and if, if you don't mind, just say your first name, what your major is, and if you have any questions to start out with, so that I'll try to incorporate answers into what I talk about. Does that sound okay? Anybody opposed? If you're opposed, you can just say, I pass. Or you can just not say anything. Okay, so let's start with Jessica. I'm Jessica. Um, I'm a bio major, and I don't have any questions to start out with. Thanks, Jessica. I'm Andrew. I'm a psych major, and I'm interested to hear also about not just vegetarianism, but veganism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, I'm Kathleen, and I'm a human biology health and society major, and I don't have any questions yet. Okay. I'm Lena. I don't have a major. So I'm calling it, and it has been called, 
the first documented experimental treatment trial of a vegetarian diet. So this book of Daniel was written about, thank you, 2,500 years ago. And I'm sure that vegetarian diets existed before that and in many cultures. Um, but this is supposedly the first documented experimental nutrition experiment that was done. So um, let's read, I'm going to go around the room and have just a few people read uh, the first line. Would you like to start, please? Sure. Uh, please test your servants for 10 days and let us uh, be given only vegetables to eat and water to drink. Okay. And the vegetables in this case, sometimes it's translated as, in different translations of the Bible, it's translated as pulse. Pulse is lentils, legumes, things like that. So they're eating some protein-rich vegetables here, or they're saying that they would like to. Um, they compare how we look with the young men who ate the king's rich food and treat their servants in accordance with what you observe. Okay, who's next? Who would like to go next? So we listened to what Daniel said and tested them for 10 days. Next. At the end of 10 days, their appearance was better and their faces were well nourished. So the guard took away their young ones for food and wine, giving them vegetables. Hooray! Vegetarian diet one, at least in the book of Daniel. I just love this story, and again, you'll probably come across it in other readings. It's used a lot, but let this be the first place you've heard it. And the Bible doesn't go on to command everybody to eat a vegetarian diet by any means, but it's, it's interesting that Daniel and his two, um, his two cohorts uh, came out ahead in this contest. So the next thing we're going to do is cover some terms, which you probably already know the meaning, or, uh, the definition of, so I didn't even fill them in. But we'll go, well, the first line is in order of getting more restrictive. So lacto over vegetarian is kind of obvious. Anyone want to throw out the definition? Nobody. No eggs and vegetables. Correct. So no meat, fish, or poultry, but or insects for that matter, which are consumed in some parts of the world, but including milk and eggs. And then going to lacto-vegetarian, <clears throat> that would be the same thing, but excluding the eggs. And then vegan. If uh, someone interested in vegan diets here. No animal products at all. And <clears throat> some vegans are very, very careful to also exclude honey. And some vegans also go beyond that and aren't even so much interested in only what they eat, but they will also be careful not to use leather products. Um, and then I even know some vegans who don't chop down trees. And trees are <laughs> not animals, but they're very interested in the ecology of the earth and they don't want to use any new wood that hasn't been cut before. Okay, how about fruitarian? If you need more copies, I'm just going to just put them on the chair here and pick them up as they come in. Fruitarian? So, fruitarian, um, so this was something in the 60s and 70s, we heard about it a little bit more. So those people did not even eat vegetables because that's part of the plant itself, but they would eat only the fruits and the nuts, which were somewhat extraneous production of the plant. Um, and even some people who would only eat fruits and nuts already fallen from the trees, they would not pick them from the trees, but they would wait until they fell. Now, the, the story with this first line here is that as you get progressively more restrictive, you know, excluding more and more food, there's the risk of getting less and less, fewer and fewer nutrients, right? So the more things you cut out of your diet, the more risky the diet is and the more careful you have to be to include the things that you might be missing. Okay, does that make sense? And I think my feeling is that a fruitarian diet is not going to be one that's nutritionally complete, probably because there's not complete protein in nuts and fruit. Um, and that's one of the reasons. And a lot of other things are being excluded, calcium and all kinds of other nutrients. So fruitarian is not something I would recommend to anyone, but I think vegan can be done. Um, what's partial 
vegetarianism. Anyone have an idea? So that's a term that was coined recently through or maybe in the last few years to cover people who are mostly vegetarian, but actually when they go out they might eat meat, or if they're at somebody's house they might eat meat. So they're for the most part vegetarian, but they're not super strict about it. And it's actually a fairly friendly term that's being inclusive of people who aren't strictly vegetarians. And some vegetarians have decided that this is a good thing. In other words, why should we be so stuffy about our vegetarianism that we call anyone who's not completely vegetarian a non-vegetarian or you know, a sometimes vegetarian? Let's call them a partial vegetarian because actually it's more inclusive it gives them the opportunity to eat fewer animals and that might be good for the animals, we think. Um, so that's a partial vegetarian. Pesco vegetarian. Does anyone know what pesco means in Latin or Italian? Fish. Right. So they would be vegetarian, but they include fish. And when I became vegetarian, I was first a pesco vegetarian, so I just stopped eating um, red meat and poultry, but I was eating fish. And then I came a day and I said, you know what, I don't have to eat fish anymore, and I stopped eating fish. So that was my progression um, of vegetarianism quite a few years ago. And you should know that we're in a very friendly atmosphere for vegetarians, both here at Cornell and in Ithaca and in the United States in general. There are some places in the world where if you went in, like maybe France and Switzerland, if you went in into a restaurant and said I'm vegetarian, they'd look at you like, what for? You know, like, why, <laughs> why are you doing that? Um, this may be an overgeneralization for France and Switzerland, but um, being a vegetarian is easy in Ithaca. It's kind of a hotbed of vegetarianism, as you know, Muslim restaurant founded here, even though they're kind of pesco right now, they're, they're still basically vegetarian. So one thing I did want to say about vegetarianism is that you should look for positive reasons to be vegetarian. Not reasons to exclude things, but reasons to include things. So if, if you are a vegetarian, a vegan, or any of these definitions, try to include as much as you can. And I think that, um, that uh, you know, advice goes to anybody who might have had an eating disorder and wants to recover and wants to think about vegetarianism as a possible way of eating. Don't use vegetarianism as an excuse to exclude things. Use it as a reason to include as much as you can and in a healthy way of the food groups that you allow. Any questions about the definitions? They're fairly straightforward. I mean, implementing them might be a little tricky, although not in Ithaca. Okay, what are the reasons for vegetarians? So I listed a few. Ethical, animal welfare, ecology. Ecology meaning if we eat from the base of the food chain rather than from the top of the food chain, it's more likely that we can feed more people, theoretically. Um, whether that's exactly true or not, I don't think it's, I don't know if it's been proven, it's probably been looked at quite a bit. And there was a very early book on vegetarianism, well, relatively early, um, in the 1960s or 70s by an author whose name is Frances Moore Lappe. Has anyone heard of her? She wrote Diet for a Small Planet. And the idea there was how to become vegetarian and eat from the base of the food chain. She's still alive, and her daughter's still alive, and they're still very interested in environmental issues. Um, eating from the base of the food chain also potentially means that you're exposed to fewer toxins, which may get concentrated as we move up the food chain. So there were a lot of reasons that she posed for vegetarianism, um, and she also was big on the idea of needing to complement your amino acids to get a complete protein. Has anyone heard of that idea? Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So sustainability, um, there could be religious reasons, and there could be health reasons. You know, dating back to the book of Daniel, but there's been a ton of research since then, and it, it is quite possible that eating a mostly plant-based diet is better for your health in terms of cardiovascular health, um, diabetes, um, cancer, and so forth. Um, of course, you can do it in a very unhealthy way. You could eat pastry all day long, and that wouldn't be so good for you. 
but if you really do eat a plant-based diet in, in a good way, um, I'm not going to give you research evidence because we're going to talk more about how to do this than, than why you should do it. Um, there is evidence there. There's also evidence or some arguments to the contrary. So there was a recent book out called The Vegetarian Myth, which somebody shared with me, which contradicts the idea of vegetarianism. I did not read the book, but I read some of the previews on Amazon. And um, I don't really agree with a lot of the premises in that book, but it's interesting to know that there are certainly opponents to vegetarianism, or people who claim they've done it for many years, but now they're healthier. They've given it up and they feel much better. So we have arguments on both sides of the coin. I think it depends really on how you do it. OK, any, any other reasons that I forgot to list? are ethical or religious, that is perhaps a reason to be very scrupulous. If your reasons are health, you could be a partial vegetarian. You can have a mostly plant-based diet. Does that make any sense? You know, somebody comes to me and they say, I'm vegetarian, what can I do? I'm going to find out what their reasons are, what's their logic behind it. Um, one person told me that she wanted to be vegetarian because she wanted to stop eating fast food. And I'm like, Good, but you could also stop eating fast food and not be a vegetarian. Okay, you know, so there's many different reasons, and it's interesting to know um, what the reason is and how much flexibility you want to have. Where do you want to draw the line? Okay, so some of the controversies. So I mentioned already, health is a controversy. Protein is a controversy. Should we get a lot of protein? Should we not get a lot of protein? Soy is a controversy. You guys mentioned that. Um, is soy good for you? Is soy bad for you? Um, should we eat dairy products? Should we eat organic? Should we fast? Should we juice? Do we need to combine the amino acids in the right pattern to get a complete human protein out of them? So those are some of the controversies. Oh, should we eat coconut? Okay. A lot of vegans are promoting coconut oil as being extremely healthy. Um, and it really isn't that good for the arteries because coconut is a highly saturated fat. It's actually yummy. Coconut oil spreads and things like that are very tasty, and it goes into a lot of Thai food, um, coconut milk does, but it's not so good in terms of saturated fat and heart health. So we'll go into a little more detail on some of these, and if I fail to complete the discussion, um, we'll come back to it. Okay, so what about protein? That's the question that most people ask, and that came up almost as one of the first questions, I think. So, I'm trying to kind of toe a middle road between some of the nutritionists who say we really don't need that much protein. And in that category, we have a couple of professors at Cornell, and you may have heard of um, Professor Levitsky and Professor Colin Campbell, who wrote the China study. They're all for saying, you know, 40 grams a day is enough, 10% of your calories is enough. On the other hand, some of us feel that it actually would be better if we incorporate more protein. It helps satisfy the appetite more. It's a better, um, it's better for muscle growth. It's better to maintain the immune system. It's better to help prevent diabetes. We don't want to err on the side of too much protein, which kind of I think the paleo diet does, the quote unquote paleo diet. Um, it's a whole other category of we don't want to eat too much protein because maybe it would be a burden on our calories. So how much is the right amount? So the number I gave for you is a half a gram per pound of body weight, roughly, which usually translates to about 60 or 75 grams a day. Um, growing athletes can use up to a gram a day. So somewhere between half a gram and a gram probably won't get you into trouble unless you really overweight and you weigh 400 pounds when you're trying to eat. 400 grams of protein a day, that's too much, I think. Do you know how, like, what percent of calories a day that would be? Because that's like statistics of that group before. The percentage of calories. Yeah. So in order to calculate percentage of calories, you have to convert grams of protein to calories. Okay, so 60 grams of protein times 4 calories per gram is 240 calories. So if you were eating 2,000 calories a day, which is about average of what you should be eating if you're not 
highly active, that would equate to a little more than 10%. So usually, so Professor Campbell says 10%. Yeah, I was a doctor with a class today. He said 10%. I think 10 percent is low. I, that's my that's my sense. Um, so 10 percent, 240 is a little more than 10 percent. Yeah. And 60 grams is not a lot of protein. And 2,000 calories is usually not too low in calories. I, I think the usual recommendation was more like 15 percent, and some people are recommending as high as 30 percent. So Levitsky and Professor Campbell err on the side of recommending, I think, too low. Some go too high. I'm trying to keep the middle road here. Yeah. I think you're actually going to answer my question. I keep going. Keep going. So never mind. OK, how do we translate the grams of protein into food? Is that what you're going to ask? Excellent question. OK, so um, I've got a little chart for you. Or you can look at food labels and you can look at the online data. Um, and so this gives you, um, it's not in order of protein content, but the first three, the first group of items are the non-vegan, the lacto-ovo items, and then we get into the vegan sources of protein. I didn't even put meat and chicken on here. If anyone wants to know, it's seven grams per ounce. It's not part of today's lecture. Question about eggs versus egg whites? Yes. Um, I, I was just looking at like, I was buying egg beaters and I was looking at egg whites versus normal eggs. Right. And the only difference, like, even like cholesterol, everything is the same, which I assume would be different because the yolk, but the only difference was that eggs, the eggs had nutrients that like A, iron, and the egg whites had zero nutrients. Nothing in it. Maybe a little bit of protein, but the only difference was the nutrients. And so I was, I was curious what you thought of eggs versus egg whites. Okay, so the whites and the yolks contain about equivalent amounts of protein. So if you have, does it say one egg or two egg whites, right? So if you had the, the white and the yolk, you'd get about seven grams of protein in a medium sized egg. If you had two whites, you'd get about seven grams of protein, or two yolks. Most of the other nutrients you notice are in the yolk. So the iron and um, vitamin A, it's, it's, it's yellow. You know, that's uh, carotene. Um, but it's vitamin A. Is the, chole the cholesterol should have li been listed as being yeah. there. The yolk has about 200 to 300 gram, sorry, milligrams of cholesterol in it. Um, and so that's about a daily limit for cholesterol. However, even though the American Heart Association says don't eat too many yolks, it's, it's quite possible that eating egg yolks doesn't raise your cholesterol very much. And there's research that shows that saturated fat, which is high fat dairy, high fat beef, and coconut oil, those are the things that trigger the body to produce more cholesterol. So cholesterol our liver produces actually outweighs any amount that's coming through the yolks in our diet. So you have a choice with yolks. <laughs> One of my colleagues said that nutritionists are playing tennis with eggs. You know, not literally. Hopefully they're hard boiled if they're really doing that. But you know, they're, we're going back and forth on the egg recommendation. I, I think it's okay to include some egg yolks. So that's, that's your choice if you're eating eggs. Um, all right, so you have some idea of now going on to the back of where um, where protein is and how much protein is in these various different products. Just keeping it keeping with this list, and before we even get into the vegan menu, um, do you have any questions about the list? Any any concerns? You've all seen seitan and tempeh. Okay. Oh, this is a vegetarian family campus. So you come in town, they are. I'm not sure. Yeah. I was a vegetarian for like many years, and then I stopped eating meat for health reasons, mm -hmm. meat gluten. And I started like craving meat. Like I felt like my body wasn't getting mm -hmm. enough protein or something. Mm -hmm. I don't really know why that is. And I started eating meat again. I'm just wondering about like um, how much like meat, meat products or like meat would affect like protein intake, like would it actually affect it that much? 
So there's definitely protein in gluten. You know, there's protein in wheat. I guess most of the protein is in the gluten fraction of the wheat, although there might be some other proteins. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we may crave certain foods, and craving meat could be due to just under eating in general. And when you gave up the meat, it was just too hard to get enough to eat. Um, it could be needing more protein, and the body says, "Ah, let me have it." Or iron. <coughs> a lot of times, food cravings come from low iron levels, so it's hard to, you know, there's not that much iron in wheat, although. Wheat flour that's been fortified with iron is a source of iron too. So it's hard to give you an exact answer to the question, but it's, you know it's it's good to try to include more foods if you're in a recovery mode or if you're feeling like you're creating them. So, um, before we go to the next section, any more questions on this chart, this list? And you know the information on food labels, you can look it up. Um, I just wanted to mention complementation. So that's going to the last bullet point above the list. So complementation was this idea that Francis Moore Lappe wrote about to the lay audience. And I had a copy of that book in the 70s. And a fellow grad student looked at it and said, gee, you have to have your PhD to be a vegetarian practically. Because she really gave charts of the um, essential amino acids needed for humans and how they were and what proportion in different vegetarian foods. And she said, you have to eat this with this, or this with this, or you never get a whole complement. And you have to do it all within the same hour. So that made vegetarianism supposedly a little bit tricky. Fortunately, I kind of just ignored the advice and just, you know, she gave a lot of recipes, which were nice. Um, but basically, in, in some sense, she's right. Remember before I said nuts are not a complete protein. They're not. So they don't have all of the essential amino acids in the right pattern for human consumption. Soy is a fairly complete vegetable protein. So, and dairy and eggs for sure are very close to human protein. But so of all the beans, soy actually comes closest to being complete in um, amino acids. There are other thoughts about soy that we'll hopefully get to later. But okay, complementation is not that hard. Because legumes, all of the beans, in other words, and peanuts are legumes, they complement nuts, seeds, and grains. So there are many different basic dishes that incorporate those. Like think about baked beans and bread, or beans and rice, or peas and rice, or dal and rice, if you, if you look at the peanut butter sandwich. I mean, these are kind of natural combinations that are eaten in societies all over the world which hopefully can help explain why people did not become protein deficient in cultures where there was not a lot of meat traditionally available. Um, so, and the other thing about that recommendation from the 70s is that since then, we have discovered that in fact, you don't need to complete the protein within an hour. The amino acids will stay around in our system for 24 hours or so. So if we get a good varied food intake over the course of the day, we can pick up different amino acids from different vegetarian foods and use them to synthesize the human protein that our bodies need to make. Sounds good? Phew, we're, we, we've been cut a break. Okay. So, so let's look at the sample vegan menu. I put that together on the second page. It's a very simple, stripped down menu. I didn't make it fancy. I just wrote down the first things that came to my head. So for breakfast, the person had peanut butter, two pieces of toast, and a cup of soy milk. And if you go through the, the list of values, you know, just adding up, them up from the list, it actually comes to 22 grams of protein. Lunch, they had chili, pasta, and salad with some cashews thrown on top. Cool. And then they had a snack with them with some crackers, and then they had dinner, which was split pea soup, stir fried tofu, and a cup of rice. Not a lot of food, not a little food, just kind of a medium amount of food, not completely unheard of food. Sounds familiar? <coughs> Lo and behold, it added up to 86 grams of protein. I was impressed. I couldn't believe it. And <laughs> of course, I focused on making sure that each meal or snack had a pro high protein food. And for the most part, they were coming from 